Why do we need to switch to all protein? Deforestation, species loss, biodiversity loss, ocean dead zones, ocean acidification, greenhouse gas emissions, any number of things that we all care about. Everything that falls under the umbrella of climate change. Factory farming is one of the top two or three you know, central causes of all of these. Things. There's a debate around whether vegans can eat cultivated meat or not. People would argue that simply taking a cell scraping from a chicken is done against the consent of the chicken. Companies, I think, have been at pains to say, yeah, but then the chicken ran away and did whatever it wanted to do, right? Why the need for substitution or replacement? Of 60 to 70% of epidemics, outbreaks of swine flu, avian flu, etc., have come from, I mean, it's in the name, right? They've come from these animal farming systems. And any one of these could make the jump to being much more transmissible, etc., to human. From a global health standpoint, this is a, it's a system that makes no sense. We've just come out of a massive pandemic and we need to be worried about the next one. A lot of vegan businesses have either gone bankrupt or they're losing out on sales. Why is that happening? I mean, honestly, my answer to that question is... Welcome to Sustainable Tea with Shreya. We've got Varun Deshpande on the show with us today. Varun, thank you so much for joining us. Would you like to tell our viewers a little bit more about what you do? Thank you so much, Rhea, for having me. It's a delight. I love the all the plants that we're that we're in the midst of. My name is Varun Deshpande. As you said, um, I was the founding managing director at an organization called the Good Food Institute in India, and then I ran the Good Food Institute across Asia subsequently. And I've also been in the healthcare space. I currently serve as a director at the Asian Institute of Oncology, which is a chain of cancer hospitals across India. What is the Good Food Institute, and what is, what does it do? The Good Food Institute is a global network of organizations focused on building the alternative protein sector. Mm. So that means any replacements for meat, eggs and dairy mm. and seafood that are meant to perfectly mimic the texture and the taste of those foods so that people can have them without a sacrifice. Right? It constitutes a simple switch, not a sacrifice. And what the Good Food Institute or GFI does is work with everyone in that space. So scientists, government folks, entrepreneurs, large corporations, students. Right. Investors, philanthropists, pretty much anyone that can help us build this new sector. It's and a private transform. and public institution. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's kind of what we call it a field building organization. So it's a field, a sector that needs to be built. And we go in and work across industry, science and policy uh, to do all of that. I should, I should start thinking about it in the past tense now because I moved on last year. Why do we need to switch uh, to all protein? Why do we need to find replacements for meat, dairy and, you know, egg as they already exist. Why the need for substitution or replacement? Yeah, it's a great question, Shreya. So, I mean, like, I think there's two parts to this question. One is, like, why is meat a problem in the first place? Which I can touch on very briefly. So, I mean, look, we, we all know this. This is why I got into this space in the first place, which is if we care about, and we all do, climate change, global health, global poverty, food insecurity, etc. Factory farming or the large-scale raising and slaughter of animals for meat, eggs, dairy, or even hunting in the case of seafood, the large-scale factory farming, animal agriculture, is one of the top two or three causes of every single one of these issues. How is it interconnected? The very basic construct here is we have to raise these animals, billion, billions upon billions of them. In the case of fish, it's trillions, one to three trillion fish every year, 60 to 70 billion land animals, which is primarily chickens, as we know, cows, pigs, etc. Um, we need to feed them and then eat their meat and their produce as meat, milk, eggs, right? So a chicken, which is the most efficient animal that we farm for meat, takes in nine, roughly nine calories of input in the form of feed like soy, corn, wheat, etc., and gives you one calorie of output in the form of meat, right? One chicken calorie. Meat. Yeah, one calorie for every nine calories it takes in. And this is the most efficient animal we farm for meat, right? Like cows are much worse, pigs are also worse. So that means we're using that much more land to grow all these crops, to feed these animals, to get meat. And this is, this is a biological limit, right? We have optimized these animals as a system over decades and centuries. We cannot get much better there, right? So That's, a, that's what it ends in terms of optimization. Yeah, yeah so the, the, the primary cause of things like deforestation in the Amazon, which impacts hugely climate change, etc., is to grow soybeans or other forms of feed for cattle, hmm. right? Uh, it's, people it's not, think it's actually for tofu that we can feed. I get yeah, that I mean, a lot. Yeah, like something like 80 to 85% of the soy that's grown in the deforested parts of the Amazon is for cattle. This is well documented now. This is admitted by the companies that produce cattle, the largest you know, cow com beef companies in the world or whatever. Um, so yeah, this is a huge misconception. But the point is that, you know, I mean, if you look at any number of the world's biggest problems under the basket of climate change, 
तो डिफॉरेस्टेशन स्पीसीज लॉस बायोडाइवर्सिटी लॉस ओशन डेथ जोन ओशन एसिडिफिकेशन ग्रीन हाउस गैस इमिशन एनी नंबर ऑफ थिंग्स वी ऑल केयर अबाउट एवरी थिंग दैट फॉल्स अंडर द अम्ब्रेला ऑफ क्लाइमेट चेंज फैक्ट्री फार्मिंग इज वन ऑफ द टॉप टू और थ्री मोस्ट यू नो सेंट्रल कॉजेज ऑफ ऑल ऑफ दीज थिंग राइट एंड देन इफ यू लुक एट पब्लिक हेल्थ और ग्लोबल हेल्थ विच इज वेर विच इज वॉट माई बैकग्राउंड वॉज वॉज थिंकिंग अबाउट हेल्थ केयर ह्यूज इशूज लाइक पैंडेमिक्स एंटी माइक्रोबियल रेजिस्टेंस दे ऑल्सो uh for the most part or for a significant portion stem from the animal agriculture system how so so let's look at pandemics right i think we've all we all know that a lot of pandemics have animal or zoonotic origins right so like a significant portion something on the order of 60 to 70% of um epidemics outbreaks of swine flu avian flu etc have come from i mean it's in the name right they've come from these animal farming systems and any one of these could make the jump to being much more transmissible etc to humans etc etc right? so that that's definitely a um a major challenge another issue of and by the way the reason that's happening is because we're growing these animals in close confined systems it's filthy conditions i mean if you grew up here in india or you see any one of these animal transport systems you're seeing these wire trucks that chickens are being transported in like right multi story like yeah i mean you know it's i'm i'm leaving aside all ethical considerations i'll get to that at the end but it's gross right that's why that's why those animals fall sick now to prevent those animals from falling sick in those conditions if i am a chicken farmer in india or a poor pig farmer in china or a shrimp farmer in india etc um and this is a generalization but a significant portion of these folks use antibiotics in the growth promoter etc that they feed to these animals For? because to keep them well so i know i'm not going to lose my stock of pigs if i'm a poor pig farmer in china right all i know is it keep it actually makes them slightly fatter which is good for for sales more, and it more, prevents them from it's falling more sick more meaty i guess in that yeah yeah right so it prevents them from falling sick makes them fatter and that's all i know as a as a poor pig farmer in china and you know so the the chinese economy is so dependent on pigs as an industry it's a 200 billion dollar industry in china that they sometimes jokingly call their consumer price index the cpi the china pig index right and they have had outbreaks of swine flu that have decimated something on the order of a quarter to a third to almost speculation is half of all pigs in that country over the last 5 years there have been repeated outbreaks of swine flu right so um asian swine fever is is what it's called right so that that is a it's a huge problem that is having huge impacts economically and you can trace its roots to these practices which unfortunately are it's a tragedy of the commons right because every individual farmer is just going to continue doing these practices until we actually make a change and the regulations are there to maybe prevent some of this etc but you can't go all the way right so from a global health standpoint this is a it's a system that makes no sense it no longer makes any sense we've we've gone far beyond what is natural etc over the last decade because we need to feed more and more people right and then that's where the food insecurity comes in i mean if i'm if i'm using all these crops all this land to feed all these people right if we did away with the system and figured out ways that we could feed people the directly supply the demand for meat and the things that people want by cutting out the middle animal it would be a much better scenario in terms of availability of land food security etc right so i think all of these things and these are all existential problems of our age we've just come out of a massive pandemic and we need to be worried about the next one right and looking historically and modeling some of this stuff out the experts i'm not an expert on that but the experts say we should be worried about another pandemic within the next 20 years where do we think it's going to emanate from right so that these are all the massive issues of factory farming in general now i think the the very pertinent question you asked is why do we need to replace meat like for like right why can't people eat chickpeas instead of chicken moong instead of mutton broccoli instead of beef yeah um i to be honest i don't know i would love if they did i would love if we all did doesn't seem to be working though does it i mean we're eating more meat than ever before is that because of income rise in income what is it industrialization what it, what do you point to when it comes to increase in meat consumption rises in income meat is meat is an aspirational food in every we see this in every country actually we see we'll see it in india over the next decades as well as incomes rise people seem to want to eat more meat and let's be real look it's it's delicious it has it's high protein it's satiating it brings people together it's a status symbol people want to eat more meat and that's just this is just the market telling us this right it's not something that i'm coming up with in places like the us in fact globally 
aside from very, very small pockets where folks are like super high income and like very evolved on climate, like the Netherlands, um, we're seeing meat consumption go up, despite everything I'm saying right now, right? Like I, I oftentimes used to make this joke when I used to give talks and say, I would give the, that first portion of the talk and say, cool, now that we've discussed all the issues with meat consumption, everyone in this room that eats meat is going to go home, stop eating meat and we're done, right? This problem is solved. And obviously that's not the case because meat demand is just going up. I mean, estimates of increases in meat demand between now and 2050 are something on the order of 65% to 250% more meat. That's kind of the opposite of what I see is going on in the UK, right? If you look at what's happening in the UK, more and more people are going vegan. And um, this is just my experience that a lot of my friends abroad are going vegan and a lot of people in India are starting to eat meat. I don't know if it's a recovering economy thing that meat is aspirational in the West, but I, I feel like a lot of people in the West are giving up meat at the same time. Is yeah. that, is it just me? So I think in terms of raw numbers, there's a bit of an availability bias here or a misconception, which is that, um, you know, a small number of people are going vegan. The number of people that are actually vegan is very small and that's growing. It's growing from a very small base. And so for everyone else, aspiration and taste and wanting to eat some more meat reign supreme, right? And so we see this all the time in countries like India and it's going to happen in sub-Saharan Africa over time. Meat supply chains will get more and more organized. They're already very organized in India. They'll get more and more organized in different countries around the world. Stronger lobbying, you mean? Um, well, they'll, they'll get more and more industrialized. Right now in Africa, maybe meat is, uh, and I'm not an expert on sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, meat is maybe like a luxury food because it's not something that everyone can afford every day. If you go to Dharavi, which is 25 minutes away from where we are speaking right now, um, if you talk to a family of four, right? Lower income, they're living in an urban slum, the largest urban slum in Asia, right? They will say, I eat one mutton meal a week for... 460 rupees and it's delicious and I love it and if I could I would eat two mutton meals a week for 920 rupees or three for 1380 or whatever right like the point is that the the limit to people's eating meat seems to be affordability rather than all of these concerns of the environment etc for the most part now I think in your enlightened circle Shreya and for you yourself I think people are making different choices and that's great I think for everyone else we probably need to provide an alternative that literally tastes the same or better. At the same price. And costs the same or less. So that is the entire theory of change of the Good Food Institute or the entire all-protein landscape is tastes the same or better, cost the same or less, available everywhere. And is that enough for people to make the switch? If it tastes the same, looks the same, has the same nutritional value, has the same cost, price point as well, is that enough for someone to make the switch? It's a great question. I think it gets us much further along to where we need to be so that people can make a choice on the basis of the things that seem to matter to them, which is taste and cost and nutrition and availability. However, I would also add, you're right, we probably also need to make it sexy in some way, right? So I think message it correctly, make sure people understand that the information that's out there about the products is correct, right? Let people make choices. There's a lot of other things that, that can be done as well, which we can talk about, things like government procurement programs, Right. So um, in places like, let's say, the Middle East or even in the U.S., where government governments are supporting dairy procure procurement or support prices for things like dairy, um, maybe we should extend the same things to alternative proteins because they're vastly better for all these other reasons. Right. Um, yeah. So th there's ways in which we can make them more competitive. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we still have to solve the issues of taste and cost first. Let's let's maybe just take a step back and talk about what is alternate protein. What is alt protein? What is smart protein? What is cultivated meat? What what's the difference between you know all of these terminologies that I keep hearing about? Yeah, and why is it happening right now at this at this moment in history? Like food science and manufacturing etc. have got to the point where we can actually aspire to do the taste the same or better and cost the same or less. So all proteins are emerging categories of food that have been making waves over the last couple of decades in some cases. There's, there's a couple of different categories of them. Um, there's plant-based foods. So foods that are made from things like soy or chickpeas or moong so as ingredients. from a plant. Yeah. So the ingredients come from plant, right? But again, the idea is to provide all the taste, juiciness and the cultural resonance of the meat products or the egg and dairy products that people know and love, right? So this is not our grandparents' soya nuggets. It's not your bean burgers, etc. And I like those things. 
right? But I think they're not maybe sexy enough from the perspective of perfectly mimicking or biomimicry of the taste of meat. So the idea with plant-based meats or plant-based eggs and plant-based dairy is to offer all the same taste and functionality. So a plant-based dairy product ideally should perform the same way in tea, coffee, any application of, of milk that you can think of that people already use, right? And that's, that's a bit of a challenge in a place like India because we use dairy for so many different things. Aside from plant-based foods, there's fermentation-derived foods. And this, kind, this is kind of intuitive because fermentation is something that's been around for millennia, right? So fermentation is when you use microorganisms like fungi to produce foods in some way, right? So um, fermentation is essentially then the use of fungi to make some of these foods. So you can either produce the foods directly from the fungi themselves. So the fungi are quite tasty, nutritious, etc. By default, they have that umami flavor that people love from their meat as well. So if you, if, if you kind of grow them at scale and you cut them into meat products, etc., you can make something that actually approaches the taste of meat. That's the idea. Um, or you can use them to ferment other products, etc., in some way as well, right? So this is kind of a, a technical area. And then finally, uh, there's cultivated meat, which you mentioned, which is sometimes mistakenly called lab-grown meat. Yeah. Right? So the idea is that you take... Cell-based, lab-grown, cultivated, cell -based, same Cell-based, lab-grown, cultivated. They're all the same. Okay. The idea of, of all of these things is that uh, we, we needed to find names for these things that are both, they acquire a meaning that is very clear to everyone involved, including consumers, regulators, etc. And they're also accurate. So for example, lab-grown is not correct because, you know, I mean, everything's produced in a lab at a very early stage. And then once you get to a later stage, it's manufactured not in a lab, right? It's manufactured in factories or whatever. Yeah. Um, Cell-based, everything has, cell, has cells, right? Like leaves have cells on them, etc. So cultivated make, made sense. It's, it's sort of like cultivating and how we cultivate in a greenhouse. You take a cutting of a plant and then you make a new plant. This is kind of how it works, except you're not taking a cutting. You're taking a tiny number of cells and producing the meat directly from them. Is, is the animal killed in the process when you, no. when you get the cells? Is the animal killed for no. the cell? They no. don't have to be, right? So the idea is actually that you would actually isolate certain cells and create cell lines from them. So you have the best chicken cell lines. You have the best salmon cell lines, etc. So you never have to go back to the animal ever again. Is that vegan? Would you consider that vegan? So that last one is not vegan. Because if you were allergic to salmon, for example, you couldn't eat cultivated salmon because it's authentically made from the cells of salmon, right? All you've done is you're just growing a salmon fillet. You're producing a salmon fillet instead of growing the fish, feeding the fish, throwing the antibiotics in there because there's like species of lice and whatever that are killing all the salmon in the aquaculture operations. You're, you're cutting out all of those steps. Um, which are insane steps in my opinion and you're getting to like what you actually want out of it. But you're not killing the animal, right? No. At the end of the day. So is no. that is that not vegan? Because a lot of, there's a debate around whether vegans can eat cultivated meat or not. What's what's your take on it? Yeah, look, there's ethical definitions, there's biological definitions, right? I think, mm. I think from an ethical standpoint, it is vastly better. Um, you know, people would argue that simply taking a cell scraping from a chicken is done against the consent of the chicken. Companies, I think, have been at pains to say, yeah, but then the chicken ran away and did whatever it wanted to do, right? It went to play with its friends or whatever, and we just use the cells to do our work, to, to experiment and to create new foods, etc. Um, so I think, yes, vastly better from an ethical standpoint. But again, from a biological standpoint, from an allergenicity standpoint or whatever, it's not exactly vegan. So anyways, all of this is to say there's multiple categories of all proteins. But in the end, I think 50 years from now, 20, 30 years from now, hopefully, We'll just call them meat. And in the morning, maybe I'll go to the supermarket and I'll say, I want something plant-based. I want like a millet-based milk drink. In the evening, I want some cultivated meat. Maybe not me personally, but, you know, people want some cultivated meat. Um, and that's, that's how life will be. It'll be like enabling choice for people based on what they know and love. Because we've created these alternatives that, that actually are a simple switch and not a sacrifice. But there's a lot of issues with regulations. When you think of naming, there's so many, I think, lawsuits going around with plant-based companies using using milk, using cheese, using yogurt, meat, whatever those words might be. So do you think we'll ever get to a point where we're allowed to use the same words? And meat is not mainstream. Like when you say meat, it's usually animal meat. So why is normal, whatever comes from an animal, and substitute as anything that comes from a plant? Why, does, why is that, that distinction that exists? And will regulation or labeling ever get over that? The root of this issue is that there are entrenched industries that, that would like to make sure that new industries don't get equal footing. 
um, and those entrenched industries, you know, have a lot of power. In many cases, rightfully so, because they employ a lot of people. Right. So the milk industry, the dairy industry in India is a huge economic engine. It's our largest agricultural product. And similarly, dairy globally doesn't necessarily want so animal dairy globally doesn't necessarily want plant-based dairy to be able to use the same terms because they feel it's their equity in some ways. So the use of the word milk is being fought and challenged through legal action and it's being addressed in courts, etc. Currently in India, there's a group of companies that are, you know, fighting this case in the high court about the use of dairy terms. And it's it's happening globally, right? And it's it's happening in many ways. It's happening at a country level, it's happening in the multilateral institutions like Codex Alimentarius of the World, you know, whatever. Uh, all of these things are happening everywhere. I think, you know, from a from a logical standpoint, consumers aren't stupid. And we at GFI India and GFI Everywhere has done, have done a lot of consumers' questions or, or surveys to ask the question, do you think almond milk comes from a cow? Like, is this confusing to you when you see it on a label? And, um, you know, I mean, I was totally shocked, but consumers were not surprised at all. Like, well, they were not confused at all by this concept. They totally understood that almond milk comes doesn't from, come. Yeah, it comes yeah, from, a it comes from almond. almond. It doesn't come from a cow. Yeah. Right. So this is this is crazy. I mean, it, to my mind, it makes no sense to try and restrict the consumer from getting access to this thing or seeing this thing simply by calling it something else, which would actually be more confusing to the consumer. Right. So now companies are having to use terms like M Y L K milk, which was which is also being challenged. They're asking them to use terms like beverage or drink. Now, if I see oat beverage on a shelf. It's really not that intuitive for me to understand this is oat milk. It'll, it's going to take me some time, which is going to disadvantage the company in today's like hyper consumerist culture of like there's like ten different yeah, choices. So right? I think so, coconut drink, coconut beverage, like you said, it's correct. it's not correct. milk. So yeah, and look, the legal basis for all of this again is it's this is just going to play out over time. It's going to be fought in legally, and it's going to be fought socially, and etc. I think that's fine. If you zoom out and you look at some of the legal basis for this, some products in the market that have been known and loved for many years already use dairy terms and they have exceptions for it, right? Peanut butter. That's true. Uh, there's so many things that are already out there that have that that use dairy terms and they have exceptions under these rules. So I think there's legal basis to take it forward. There's also traditional foods that are actually rice milks and whatever, like horchata in, in Latin American countries and whatever, right? So th I think there's an opportunity here to to come to a sensible solution, but it's going to take time. And given that these industries that exist already that employ so many people have power and they're, in, they're intent on making sure that these new industries don't have an equal footing, I think it's going to take time to play out. That might come from resistance, right? A lot of this might be them feeling threatened about new players in the market and their business being affected and just maybe using lawsuit as a distraction to really uh, you know, take the attention away from what's going on. Absolutely. And the way that the way that we would love to set this up and, and to make clear, like I personally would love to set this up as an opportunity for everyone. I mean, the folks who have the most opportunity to gain from this are entrenched industries that already know the consumer and vice versa. They have distribution. They understand the, the product. Right. So whoever's in the space of milk in India, uh, without throwing out any names, should ideally be starting lines of plant based foods. It makes total sense. Some of them, you know, the cooperatives have started have started selling edible oils and, and other things. Again, because they have distribution, they have a farmer network, they're great for the farmers, etc. Um, this is another opportunity. Why aren't they? What's stopping milk companies in India that are already established from tapping into plant-based milk? Good question. It's, it's happening in pockets globally, right? It's happening in, in India in some pockets as well. Like, for example, we know that Hershey's has one of the largest selling plant-based milks in India. Uh, and I think it will happen. I think it will happen with some of the other folks who are resistant to this over time as well, right? We've seen it happen, for example, plant-based meats. Some of the largest selling or biggest brands in plant-based meats are from big food companies or meat companies, right? And if you hear the likes of, you know, JBS, which is the largest meat company in the world, one of the folks that, um, that does some of the, the work in the Amazon that we've been talking about prior, uh, they've had plant-based brands. They've subsequently shuttered it, and we can, we can talk about where the market is now. But at the time, I remember speaking to one of the folks who was in charge of growth for their brand in the US, and he said, look, we're growing a thousand percent year on year with our plant based line, and we're going to keep growing a thousand percent year on year because this is a different product, but we know the consumer. We have distribution, and also because it's plant based, it doesn't have the same requirements for storage and transport that our meat does. Our meat is a microbiologically much more active product, meaning from a food safety standpoint, with plant based, you don't have all Higher of the issues. Shelf life? 
yeah, higher shelf life. You don't have the issues of like E. coli, salmonella, etc. You don't have to treat it with kid gloves the same way you have to do with with this, with meat, right? However, they transport transport beef around. You don't have to have the same cold chain. You obviously do need to have cold chain, etc. But it's not the same stringent requirements because it's not as sensitive a product to all of these issues, whereas meat is. So all of these folks really understand meat, milk, eggs, and crucially the consumer and how to get to the consumer. Um, you know, like the Dudwala culture in India is fantastic, right? Like it's a really great system to get food to people fresh. Um, it makes total sense for the same folks to invest in plant food. The biggest criticism that I get just talking about, you know, all protein and um, any plant-based uh, substitutes that exist is that it's highly processed. But I know that meat is processed as well. So how healthy are plant-based proteins? How healthy are, you know, all these alternate proteins and smart proteins and cultivated meat? Are they nutritionally, are they comparable to the to the normal animal product, any of the animal products that exist? Yeah, a quick point of information here, by the way, just just to interject. So you use the word, you use the term smart protein, which makes me really happy because uh, globally, this whole category is called alt protein, alternative protein, means an alternative to the main thing. So in India, we wanted to make it sound better, right? Like we we would love if alt proteins are no longer alternative. At that point, we would consider the Good Food Institute would consider our job done and we would consider ourselves obsolete and disband and go hang out elsewhere. Right? So the but fact that I use smart protein is a, is a win. from It's a huge win because in India, we've been trying to get people to say smart protein instead of all proteins because we think that's a better way to reserve, refer to all of this stuff. It's just mm. a smarter way to make meat, in my opinion. I like that. Um, anyway, so coming back to what you said, on in terms of processing, etc. Look, everything is processed. We live in a modern era. Um, it's really about what's actually in the thing and what the techniques of processing are, right? And to your point, meat is one of the most processed things. If you think about, let's not even talk about the individual animal and feeding the animal and all that stuff. Let's talk about what happened prior to even the animal being born, right? The wild fowl, the jungle fowl that was running around in the, in the jungles of Madhya Pradesh and Andhra Pradesh is not the chicken we're eating today, right? And you can talk to some of the folks that run poultry operations in India. They will tell you, um, they are extremely scientific about the way they go about their work, right? They will say, look, we have reached from a bird weight, one bird's weight of 1.4 kilograms in the year 1990. We've now reached 2.3 kilograms. We're still behind the 3.4 kilograms that the US has attained. Science is in food all the time, everywhere we look. And I recognize that that's not romantic. It's not fun for people to think that food is technology. I think people have an ick around it. In fact, if you look at some of the consumer surveys that we ourselves have done or looked at other surveys that other people have done, India is one of the countries with among the highest neophobia when it comes to food, meaning new things in food, meaning technology in food, That's technophobia for food. Right? Okay. It's on the higher end. So India might be particularly complex when it comes to this processing stuff. But the fact remains that everything is processed. Meat in particular is particularly processed. So some of these plant-based foods where they are today is yes they are processed there's a certain number of ingredients on the label but it's getting better all the time and even where it is now is um, it contains proteins amino acid mix in in the way that you want um, you know in fiber which is not available in in animal-based meat etc so it does contain the nutrients that we can control for and over time when this as the science gets better you will see instead of 11 ingredients on a label you'll see seven automatically because we'll no longer be working with ingredients that were optimized for some other industry decades ago we'll be working with crops like chickpea pigeon pea etc where we've directly gone back to the farmer and we've said hey we need this varietal of that crop so that we can make this end product of plant-based milk which has all the i'm not a food scientist i just played one on tv for six years but essentially foaming gelling emulsification protein stability all of the things that actually make it perform a certain way in an end product and that's how you get a really fluffy scrambled egg that's made from plant or how you get a really creamy plant-based milk that performs extremely well and doesn't split when you put it into hot coffee, right? And you get that creamy mouthfeel and all the stuff that people really love from the food that they eat. We'll get there. What is in plant-based meat? What are the ingredients that people are actually scared of? Yeah, what's in plant-based meats? So you use things like soy protein, right? You use things like starches, you use things like emulsifiers, etc. Stuff that's already in a number of the other packaged food products we eat and you just make them a certain way. So to make a plant-based meat product, you put it through a process called extrusion, which is, yeah, which is what pasta is made in the same way. The processes are quite similar. It's just you use different amounts of heat and pressure because what you want in a plant-based meat product is 
moisture, juiciness, etc. What you want in a pasta is the opposite of that, right? It, it needs to last on a shelf until you hydrate it and make it. So you use different types of extrusion or different types of processes to get to an end product. Now, to answer your question directly about stuff that's bad in food, gen like in, in plant-based meats or in food generally, you want to watch out, and by the way, I'm not a clinical nutritionist, but one wants to watch out for stuff like trans fats, universally bad. The Indian Food Safety and Standards Authority, FSSAI, has just um, put restrictions on, on trans fats for manufacturers. So you'll see that come down in everything that's on the market, plant-based meats or Lay's chips or whatever, right? That's all. That's going to come down over time. Hmm. Just uh, regulations. Yeah, right? So stuff like trans fats is really is bad for you anyway. We shouldn't have that stuff in there. Nitrates, which are present in a lot of uh, animal sausages, right? The, you don't want that stuff. That stuff is carcinogenic. You don't want to eat that stuff. So try to keep your uh, intake of that quite low. Sodium, you want to be within certain ranges. So if, you, if you're eating a lot of packaged food products that have a ton of sodium in them, maybe try to alter your diet so you're not eating all of that stuff all the time. Generally, I would say if someone's eating a whole food plant-based diet that's replete with vegetables and fruits and grains and nuts and whatever, you're doing well. You don't have to substitute that stuff for a plant-based meat. But if you are eating a ton of animal meat and especially processed animal meat products, switching over to a plant-based meat, at least a few of those occasions, would be great for your health. What are these plant proteins made out of? What are, what are the primary ingredients that we use to um, replicate meat? Soy, um, like soy protein, is a big one. Um, because that industry has been very large for a long time, right? So the, the animal feed industry has existed for a very long time. Soybean oil industry has existed for a very long time. So that coming as an ingredient into a new industry has been quite easy because that commodity is available. More recently, things like pea protein have come, have, have come into prominence because of companies like Beyond Meat in the US using them. And they're quite... Is that from, from peas, like green peas? Yeah. So you grow... It's actually yellow peas. Um, just a different type of... It's a different varietal of pea. The good news is you can use the, 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 the amazing toolkit we have in terms of the agricultural biodiversity in a place like India or anywhere globally to try out many different ingredients in the plant kingdom for this end product. Right? So let's say we have some number of hundreds of thousands of plant species that are available to us. And within those, you have so many varietals. So if you're trying to get the protein out and make it into an end product, you want something that's higher protein and func functional protein in terms of how it performs in the end product. Right? So these are the things you're optimizing for. So, you know, India is a particularly apt place, we've always argued, for all of this. Definitely. But traditionally, what's being used is soy, pea protein. Uh, what's mycoprotein? That's something... Fermentation different. derived. Mycoprotein is fungi protein. It's fungi protein. Yep. But fungi being an organism, hmm. is that vegan? I, I, don't, I don't think anyone has a really good answer to that question. Are fungi vegan or not? Are, like, mm. are mushrooms vegan? Mm. Right? Because the mushroom is, is part of the fung fungus, fungi kingdom. Mm. Um, there's plants, animals, fungi. It's yeah. a different kingdom of, of, piece, of organism. I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. But like, so do, are, are people who are vegan, eat, do, they, do you eat mushrooms? I do. I've, I've had to because I, feel such, like I should know the big, answer to this question. <laughs> such a big <laughs> source of protein. And it's the only alternative that you, you know, you might find. Sometimes it's just the protein source. It's just mushroom. That's all you get. Fair As enough. I mean, at least back in the day and now you've started getting tofu yeah. and tempeh and all these other, you know, plant-based uh, meat alternatives. Yeah. That, but, you know, the mushroom is actually the fruiting part of the, of the fungus and the, the rest of it is the root, etc., which is actually more nutritious. It has more, so mycoprotein by default has more protein than just the button mushroom that you're eating all the time. That's interesting. But Jens don't eat mushrooms for some reason. Like my mom would not eat mushroom because she's like, no, organism. Jainism is actually really interesting, right? Like as a, as a moral philosophy, Jains have been ahead of the curve on a lot of these things when it comes to suffering, hierarchies of consciousness, ahimsa, etc. We have, we have a lot of these moral philosophies in India. And by the way, I'm not particularly educated on a lot of moral philosophy, so I'm going to sound really stupid <laughs> in saying all of this. But the point is that we have a ton of moral philosophies in India that that are great ways to live, in my opinion, and they map really well on, onto everything we're talking about, right? So, I mean, folks who are steeped in those philosophies might come back and say, okay, a lot of the ideology you're talking about here borrows from a kind of global, often Western mindset of thinking about climate change, etc. But we've actually been thinking about many of these things like suffering, consciousness, etc. in India for much, much longer. Yeah. But Jen still use a lot of leather, you know, Jen still probably consume honey, which is, I mean, goes against the principle of ahimsa. 
a lot of gens of course consume a lot of dairy and they you know believe that our monks used to consume it and you know we used to serve it to god and um coming back to hinduism you know krishna and there are all these examples that are being that people use as reference points to justify the consumption of dairy have you come across any cultural backlash with the work that you did at gfi like was culture a part of um you know working with businesses or changing the perception that people have towards these products Yeah, I think so. I I think some of the dairy stuff that we've been talking about is quite is quite apt for this part of the discussion. I think generally, you know, I, meat as well is quite culturally entrenched in many subcultures within India. I think people assume we're mostly vegetarian, etc., which is only partially true, right? We eat much. We have many many more vegetarians than anywhere in the world. Many of those vegetarians are not pure vegetarians, right? They're Tuesday Saturday vegetarians or right so i think we have a lot of these um moral philosophies common ground which is a good way to approach it so while i have had push back on cultural grounds i think we have a lot of common ground on which to speak and kind of wrap the the unfamiliar in the familiar which is a great way to approach these conversations otherwise you're never going to actually move forward right we're all going to be in our own echo chambers fighting with each other it makes no sense you touched upon the economic aspect of the dairy industry the reason they you know they have power is because i guess they employ a lot of people and there's a i mean a lot of money that's being put in these industries even in the form of subsidies what when you talk about replacements and finding alternatives isn't that going to harm the economic side of things jobs that are dependent on it livelihood number of farmers that depend on the dairy industry and the meat industry how do you tackle that from a policy point of view from a government point of view and also from a business think tank point of view as well how do you um you know bring all of those things together with the economic factor as well yeah and the economy is a massive um complex beautiful and oftentimes very ugly thing uh, like india for example is a is a top 5 exporter of beef in the world uh not number 1 it's like among the top 5 it's it's primarily buffalo so it's cow beef it's not beef but it's classed similarly globally or whatever so in those lists we always come in the top 5 which is not something that anyone from outside india anyways is always surprised by this stat right so so that's obviously an industry that's employing a ton of people the leather industry employs a ton of people but people think that's a by product which it's not i think it's an industry in itself or not i think i think i know it's an industry in itself but um you know a lot of people think that because it's you know meat and dairy industry just a by product of that and they're not really humming and was in the process but yeah there're a lot of like you said jobs depend on that as well and and again you know something like something on the order of 50 to 60% of our of our population is um you know dependent on agriculture for livelihood mm. Mm. right which is huge it's a huge number of people and a significant non zero proportion of those people are in the dairy industry it's our largest agricultural product it's only going to get much much bigger right so i think when when we ask these like really large macroeconomic questions actually what we're talking about initially is a small industry of alternatives to meat eggs and dairy smart proteins growing taking its own time to develop improving over time etc getting to taste parity price parity and all of that and over time hopefully there will be a large enough industry that can absorb many of those same people into those jobs as a country we have to transition from a primarily agricultural economy into a manufacturing services based economy etc anyway right so this can be one of those pillars of green growth for india right if we're building a 21st century economy we should be investing in 21st century industries and that's the idea here um and this is this is a story that's again economies are very complex and weird but if we create growth we can absorb people into these new jobs we we have to be very deliber- deliberate about it i'm not the kind of person who's going to say oh the invisible hand of the market's going to solve everything right ideally we need to work hand in hand with each other as industries invest in new areas and then make sure that there are safety nets for people to be retrained and moved in, into these areas and you know some folks are doing really great work on the vegan side of this uh, the plant based side of this by working with farmers and helping them transition over to or to add in some of these crops in different parts of the world so upskilling and transfer of jobs and i'm yeah. guessing even giving them the financial resources yeah. Uh, yeah. the training education yeah. whatever that requires yeah. to be able to make that shift but i don't think you can leave it up to a free market i don't think that's how yeah. we're going to solve this and and by the way these are lessons that we need to learn from the broader economy as an industry right we're a very young industry and i mean that chronologically but also demographically we skew younger right like we all of us have not been in business for like 70 years to know everything that's been happening so we need to learn from other industries like if you look at 
any number of you know conversations about dying industries in any country let's say in the us there's this big conversation about how manufacturing in the us died and moved elsewhere everyone else is taking our jobs china's taken our manufacturing industry etc well retail is dying now because like um e-commerce you know, yeah exactly e-commerce is killing retail or someone in like you know mcdonald's or the service fast food service industry which is a big industry in the us is is hemorrhaging jobs because a screen is now replacing the person who used to take your order right so like i mean people need to be retrained and moved into new jobs these these programs exist these principles exist we need to learn and and work together to move things forward so we just spoke about green growth and how a lot of um new jobs would be created considering that vegan businesses would grow and the plant based economy will hopefully grow but what i've noticed is that a lot of vegan businesses have either gone bankrupt or they're losing out on sales and a lot of them don't find that um the 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 scalability the scale that you know other industries or other products achieve why is that happening yeah i th- i think we have to think about this in in two ways one is like how much of this is actually just cyclical markets going up and down the broader macroeconomic stuff related to how much funding is available in a market how much enthusiasm is there therefore how many companies get started how much they're able to kind of discount the cost of their product and get it out there to more people and sales go up during that time etc during the pandemic while obviously we were getting to a point where the global economy is going to be challenged plant based sales went up a lot right globally right so companies like impossible foods and beyond meat multi billion dollar companies that have decent sales uh, on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars in sales combining the two they were able to do multiple cost like multiple pricing cuts like 20% and then again 20% within the span of like 12 to 18 months which means that restaurants were picking them up putting it out there in the market etc i'm giving the example of the us market because it was quite developed at the time um and then subsequently their sales have slightly dipped or not grown that much right so now we are asking the question we're questioning the entire endeavor of 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 plant based meats or smart proteins um when some of this can be explained by there was a big run up and now there's a bit of a dip and all the fundamental things that still need to be solved and i think this is the bigger point they need to be solved so things like really getting to taste parity really getting to cost parity right and this happens by investing in more science deepening the supply chain making the entire industry more mature etc so we're not like you know transporting one component from europe one component from wherever else and then making it in the us this is all going to have an impact on the cost basis for the end consumer right so i think making the industry more robust and mature so that we can get to a point where they taste the same or better and cost the same or less is still the fundamental truth right so we'll have these market cycles up and down in places like india it's been really delightful like we've worked very closely on some, something on the order of now 70 plus companies are doing plant based meat eggs and dairy many of them are already launched in the market and that's great some of the products are really good right um and there will be consolidation many of these folks will go out of business and these are the conversations we've had with many to most of them starting from the beginning not just with entrepreneurs but with large ingredients providers all the large commodities players where we would say stuff like look you know let's let's think in three year increments go on this journey with us right in some cases it was talking to the head of a business line in india who had no interest in this yet in india but their global counterpart in their multinational company was doing something in europe or the us so we would work with them and say go talk to this person inside your own company sitting out of europe and they will tell you what your company is doing in plant based and here's the indian market scenario here's what it could be but not without concerted effort right so let's you know think in three year increments let's see where the market goes let's develop this market together i think all of those things are still true right so if we really want to solve this problem we have to go a long uh, i think a long way further in terms of making the products better and more accessible to people that only comes by everyone coming together in some sort of like essentially go mission mode on this we need to make improvements in science industry and policy every everything that's every big endeavor that's ever been achieved right on a massive social level usually has involved these components right so we need governments industry and scientists to all come together and say this is a thing worth doing and we need to really pull it together identify here's the research topics we need to work on create centers of excellence to train people and to do that research transfer technology to the market more entrepreneurship more investment etc we're still very early in this journey 
and that's that's where we are there's a lot of government subsidies going into the meat and dairy industry so how do you divert that and how do you rechannel that i think one great way of not getting into the zero sum games that we've talked about here already is to not try to divert anything i don't think it makes sense to compete with the meat industry for subsidies etc right so there are great programs that are run by the government of india and other governments that are focused on developing climate resilient technology that are focused on developing nutritional technologies etc and that applies to all of this so you know we've worked with government agencies like the biotechnology research and and assistance council birac um the the ministry of science and technology niti aayog folks like this to do round tables to come up with ways in which all smart proteins can be included in in programs they're already doing so there's a national bio manufacturing um program that's been set up now by the department of biotechnology that includes in its subtopics it includes alternative foods and smart proteins right so we're getting there but we need a lot more of this my personal assertion is we ideally we need a national mission for smart protein how do we make that happen uh keep going right so i think work with the government agencies that really understand all of this the way that the way that policy advocacy or strategic advisory to policy bodies works usually is you find your individual champions inside each of these bodies just as you would do with any kind of endeavor work with those folks help them see that this could be a legacy of theirs pushing this forward creating india as a centerpiece of this if of this emerging space globally is an historic achievement and we really should be moving forward with that right so individuals in these different bodies have been super um forward thinking about all of this and they have to their own credit moved a lot of this stuff forward right so that's been really great for us to work with them you know there there's other examples of folks in universities center for cellular and molecular biology um institute of chemical technology mumbai and there's like so many of these acronyms that i could just throw out there but the point is that many of these are also government research institutes that are you know in india and in at many times globally they're in like top lists of stuff for chemical engineering molecular biology things like that so i think working uh with all of these folks with varied stakeholders bringing people together and moving it forward is what we need to do and there's there's other case studies of success that we can look to for encouragement so there's now a national green hydrogen mission which looked quite similar folks from industry and kind of the the civil society ecosystem got together with the government and said this is something we need to move forward because energy is a big deal right so i think that there's, there's an opportunity here um to move things forward and get to a point where we're really really building something unique in india that it's fit for local context it capitalizes on our unique kind of our talent pool all of the things we've been talking about like our agricultural biodiversity um you know all of the things that we've done in other industries as learning points and kind of takes things to the next level it's just about how does a vegan business or vegan startup find hope in this market in this economy with you know the current dip and looking at other business models that may not have been that successful and how do they still go to market how do they still find that product market fit and think of the scalability growth success valuations whatever that might be that a normal startup goes through considering the landscape the really hard thing about everything we're doing is to go from the early adopter who is already convinced that they want to eat plant based meats to go to the true mass market the solution for that has always been taste price convenience make it sexy and that's a hard thing to do one thing that offers me hope though is that i've seen a lot of the entrepreneurs themselves recognize more and more even though they did at the beginning recognize more and more that they're on a shared mission and so they are not competing against each other per se right the bigger prize is to compete against the non consumption of these products right to compete against what someone would have been eating otherwise right so folks that are in some of these larger companies are trying to come together maybe and co-promote the entire category which is a big win what's the future of all protein in india on a long enough time scale the future of all protein in india looks like um decentralized production of fermentation derived protein so that you're looking at agri waste coming off a farm and immediately being used as food to grow mycoprotein right there in a small unit so the farmer is benefiting from it it looks like like i said earlier our shelves in supermarkets stocked with chickpea based millet based pigeon pea based and not just here trader joe's in the us someone's walking across the the aisle and there's like 
all of this American stuff and then there's this one Indian product and they're like, wow, that looks cool because it has the picture of the farmer on it that grew those chickpeas or millets or whatever, right? Um, and so they picked that out, right? It looks like um, a less polluted city. It looks like more access to land to do all of the other stuff that we want to do with it, right? So net afforestation projects or renewable energy projects because we've finished, we've freed up all of this land now to use for other things, right? So I think it looks like more choices for consumers and it looks like essentially we've built a better planet. Now, that is a utopian distant future. What we need to get there is we need to ride out bad patches like this one, right? I think we need to build stronger institutions that are specifically focused on funding smart proteins, right? And making sure that we get through these patches. And that usually means the private sector, but it also means bringing together kind of the social sector and policy pieces. So I think that's like the, the milestone for the next five years, in my opinion, should be continuing to build a more robust sector because gaps still exist. Um, and then just more of the same. How do we get more funding or is there enough funding for alt protein based startups? You know, even globally, in history, something on the order of, let's say, $15 billion has flowed into all protein startups. $50 billion. One five. One five. $15 sound, billion. Actually, that sounds like a decently large number, right? But that includes some companies that have raised hundreds of millions or over billions of dollars and then everyone else. Renewable energy last year, if I'm not mistaken, got about $500 billion of investment in one year, right? So like... So I, and the assertion we're making right now, just on the basis of the facts, right? I'm not making a moral argument. On the basis of the facts, this is a transformation. The protein transition is as important as the renewable energy transition, right? So these numbers are actually vanishingly small relative to the size of the challenge. And by 2030, by the way, renewables need to get to three times more. So we need like $3 trillion every year going into renewables. So we should be looking at roughly the similar number going into all proteins. Your question was, how do we get there? Um, I don't have a fantastic answer to that question, right? It's basically uh, work with more investors in the private sector, right? It's identify where the gaps exist. There's usually some valley of death that exists for specific new technologies, which could be great science coming out of a lab, but transferring it to market and forming a company is usually a gap, right? So maybe focus on helping seed stage startup investors or series A stage startup investors to understand the science and do the diligence so that they can invest at an earlier stage and help form those companies while recognizing the risks involved with investing further upstream. It also looks like getting like actual infrastructure funders to fund factories, right? So that's usually, these are like big gaps that usually exist for any new technology. It's true in other climate tech spaces also, but in all proteins, if I'm a plant-based meat producer or if I'm an ingredient producer, one issue that I have is that regular banks aren't necessarily extending me the same terms when I go to take debt to start a factory because I'm a new industry and they're like what is this like I, I, like, I don't understand what this is right um, folks like the World Bank IFC International Finance Corporation or Asian Development Bank etc say they want to fund green sectors and kind of climate forward sectors so I mean to work, work with folks like them to make sure that they have their eye on these on the ball on these things and move stuff forward a lot of this just looks like plugging away basically for the no, next it does, 10, but I think there's that um, I don't know this opportunity cost almost like do the bigger companies tap into this does that kill the smaller companies you know if there's a there's somebody with the money and the resources and all of that tapping into plant-based milk or plant-based protein and imagine a smaller startup trying to compete with that there's no way that you know they can at that scale and at that level is that still a win-win or I I think large companies are essential a part of this ecosystem, right? They they serve so many people. They, again, know what supply chains look like, know what marketing looks like, know what distribution looks like. ITC Foods is like an example. They're doing so well. Um, it's too early to say whether this should be an N of 5 market or an N of 200 market. Usually, markets over time tend towards consolidation for the most part. I will say that India in general is so much more fragmented than the West, though, which I mean, that, that's, that can be a very healthy thing for a new space like this, right? It means that startups can come in, attain a certain size, and hopefully, you know, stick around in the market as opposed to getting wiped out by a large corporate partner. What I have also seen, painting with a very broad brush, so not, not speaking of any company in particular, Indian corporations tend to be less risk-taking and less 
which which usually means less like sort of innovation focused. They understand the consumer really well, but they're not necessarily looking to make the product themselves. So there's an opportunity there for startups to collaborate with corporate partners rather than see each other as competition. You'll still have your Nestle's, which is now just like, I mean, you know, very glad to see they're, they're putting out lines of plant-based food products. They just signed a deal with um, with the group the Impresario, which does Social and Boss Burger, I think, to put plant-based meat products there, etc., which is great, right? So you'll have Nestle, that's their own products because they have global R&D and all that stuff. But for every Nestle, you'll also have other folks that do it in partnership with some of these startups. So I think there's an opportunity and I think it's too early to say whether it's going to break down to all these corporations are going to take over everything, etc. Hmm. So you need both. You need both. You absolutely need both. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's collaboration happening, that you can amplify that and grow faster. Yep. And get bigger. Yeah, that's very well said. Do it absolutely. alone. So yeah, definitely that. I noticed that you use plant based or smart protein, but you don't really use the word vegan. Is there a psychological reason as to why we prefer plant based over vegan, or um, is it just like marketing? Is it bad rep? Is it just the perception? But I see that you know the the fight between plant based versus vegan. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like in all the consumer surveys we've ever done and seen from externally, um, it seems like the word vegan is a bit of a bad word for consumers and you don't want to be drawn into that debate. And therefore, we just use plant-based. And we've encouraged a lot of entrepreneurs to use plant-based as well because it seems to be a bit more inclusive, etc. To be honest, I don't even know if that's still true. I think it may have been more true six years ago than it is now. I think um, great voices, including yourself, right, have moved this market to the point where people are aware and not necessarily seeing it as like a activism oriented thing or so, like, you know, all the it's jokes. It's hard that people... not to be an activist though. I feel like the more you know about this industry and the more you know about animal agriculture and what's really going on behind closed doors, it's hard not to be an activist. You feel so deeply and so passionately about uh, these issues and these causes that even if I don't intend to be an activist, sometimes you know, it just comes across as activism. So I've tried not speaking about it, but the you know, the less awareness that there is and the, you know, quieter that we are, I feel like the misconceptions just grow. So I've decided to, I think, to speak about it more vocally, even if it comes with speculation and surveillance and being under the microscopic lens of everyone just trying to call you out and try to, you know, catch you red-handed. Are you doing this? Are you doing that? You know, is that is that milk vegan? Is that bag leather? It comes at that cost, but I feel like it's it's really important to talk about it because everything you mentioned, taste, parity, cost, nutritional value, um, I think there needs to be awareness and education before all of that. I think that's fair. And I think people like yourself, many entrepreneurs with whom we've worked have been better than me at this in terms of being able to really wear their values on their sleeve and speak about it. I think I think very many vegans and especially people who already are like kind of really focused on activism have had this moment where it's like, wait, why am I the insane person? Everything else, everything that's happening in this world is actually insane, right? Like, I, 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 I totally empathize with that. And I think, um, I don't think I've been particularly good at being that kind of voice. I think where, for me personally, what I think I've been good at is appealing to, uh, in a sort of, this is going to sound like such corporate sanitized speak, but it's, it's not like sort of appealing to young people, appealing to scientists, appealing to government partners, folks like, on the basis of things that matter to them, kind of approaching this in a different way. That's been what I've been focused on. But like I say, I, I don't even think that that might be as necessary now as it was six or seven years ago. I think the like I think people's understanding of all of this has moved a little bit further along, which is great. And that's to the credit of the people that I'm talking about, people like yourself. No, but I think you need both because there's definitely people coming into this from a health point of view, from a nutrition point of view. They want facts. They want you know science-backed arguments. So I think there's emotional uh, storytelling at play, but there also needs to be, it needs to be backed by science. It needs to be backed by logic, by numbers and uh, quantitative research for sure. So I think there's definitely collaborative wins. Again, I think just need everyone to come together in this movement. I recently watched a video, Plan Based News. They do amazing, you know, street interviews. And I, I saw them interview this, uh, you know, one guy and he said that I'm a man, of course I eat meat that's what makes me manly and I get these you know arguments and notions about meat eating being masculine what do you think of toxic masculinity or being a guy who doesn't eat meat and promotes smart protein all protein in in such a big way to my mind I think the most masculine thing that that one can do is to literally fashion a new world that is better in very many ways uh, and that's what I'm trying to live up to in my life and I think so I think for again 
this this also touches on what we talked about before in terms of activism. I also think like an essential complement to activism or a form of activism is just dedicating your life and career to fashioning that new world. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do, right? So I think the the masculinity around meat thing is just so crazy. It, it makes no sense anymore, right? Like I, you know, the, you could make the argument that the most masculine thing you can do is is be kind to recognize that we have power as a species that we should not be wielding in the ways that we're wielding, right? That we don't have some sort of moral dominion over other species, that we shouldn't be perpetuating this absolute travesty of an industry that has like pigs that can that literally cannot move more than an inch or two for their entire lives, right? It, it, the whole thing makes no sense. And I think the most masculine or human thing that you can do is to step away from that, right? That This is where I'm coming from personally. Aside from that, I struggle with <laughs> telling other people how to live their lives. Um, but at some point with some folks, I think the issue is that we just don't agree on the facts, right? Like you'll see folks that are talking about how actually raising cattle is good for the environment and et cetera, right? Where like uh, the data actually just vastly disagrees with you. Right, like among the worst things for the environment is methane that's coming out of cattle, etc. So I, I, yeah, at that point it's really hard to even have a conversation, right? But I think if you're actually able to have a conversation where people agree on the facts and the foundation of what the truth is, then beyond that I think you can have all of these other conversations relating to morality and toxic masculinity and etc. Right? Um, and that's that's how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> so you've never come across any have you had heated arguments or debates with anyone about the line of work that you're in or what you do and why you do it heated arguments or debates no I don't think so I mean to be honest I don't even necessarily pick those fights like I say I don't think I'm a particularly good activist like my you know very many friends or family members etc I, I, I just don't like talk about this yeah. stuff yeah I mean they, 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 they want to talk about work I've done because they find it interesting and then they might try the products and etc. I think that's 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 what I'm trying to accomplish right so Have that's you great. change someone's mind about plant-based meat by making them try any of the products that you're working on. Have you shifted yeah. someone's we, perception? We've had like for example, here's an example. We've had a super outspoken investor, very well respected, really sharp erudite guy who's talked publicly about like, hey, what is this stuff? It's not going to work in India. He used different words, but um, what is this? It's not going to work in India. And then a few months later, he visited us in our office in January 2019. And at the end of a 90-minute conversation, he said, can I be on your board? Right? So, like, we've had these types of conversations, right? Where people's, like, like the scales seem to come down from their eyes. Right? So, we've had, we've had that. And that, for me, what's worked is usually meeting people where they are, helping them understand on the basis of data and, like, their own incentives, what they want to achieve. This makes total sense. Right. And, you know, sometimes the, the challenge with that is that they still then retain some of their core goals that run counter to this, but at least they've taken this on as a piece of work. Right. So that investor might still invest in dairy, but at least he might consider investing in plant based also, whereas earlier he just would not have done. Right? How do you shift consumer mindset? Uh, that's a really hard one. I think there's, you know, one of the things that I think makes a lot of sense, as I've said earlier, is to learn from these other industries. They've been really, really successful campaigns like, uh, what's the the national egg one, the Sunday Hoya Monday Rose Ka one day, right? Or uh, the Dude, 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 Wonderful Dude, or Got Milk in the US, or, you know, looking at other, like, completely random things, Bus Ek Boond, which is a polio vaccination thing by Amitabh Bachchan, which is widely considered one of the best public health campaigns in history because vaccination rates for polio went went through the roof. So, yeah, I think I think learning from these kinds of folks definitely makes a lot of sense, which is why, by the way, I think, again, companies cooperating with each other seeing this as a, we're going to create a broad category awareness campaign type situation rather than competing with each other on like individual brand awareness. That makes a lot of sense, right? So like rising tide that lifts all boats as opposed to just like competing on for like a small piece of a small pie or like a larger piece of a small pie. I think all of that makes sense to, to try and be super professional about helping people go from awareness to trial to repeat purchase to ritual etc cetera, etc cetera. i think all of these approaches we know they make sense they just take time and the time actually is that a time scale of on the order of decades that's the issue right and in the meantime work on making the products fundamentally better also um people assume that soy is bad for you or at least there's this misconception that um you know soy is really bad for your health and obviously a lot of these plant-based meats are made out of soy where, where do you stand on soy as an ingredient in the health and nutrition value aspect? I think usually presenting people with some facts does help a lot, right? So, I mean, you'd have to eat a ridiculous amount of soy, like tofu, for example, or plant-based meats, 
to actually have that be have a clinical impact on you in terms of your estrogen production. So like you need like something on the order of 14 servings of tofu a day. A day. The supposed isof- isoflavones to have the effect on your estrogen like endo- endogenous ex- estrogen production. And by the way, again, not a doctor, not a clinical nutritionist. Definitely overall advice that is the best advice is have a nice balanced diet and get all your nutrients macro and micro. But yeah, I I think all of this stuff is way overblown and once you talk about that and show people some facts, it does help. Right? So um yeah, it's it's um something to watch out for if you're generally healthy. Uh this is really not this is like way overblown and you need to watch out for like sources of misinformation that give you that. So at GFI, you worked with different stakeholders from governments to policy makers to entrepreneurs, philanthropists. What role do each of these stakeholders play in amplifying and accelerating the plant-based revolution? Let's start with maybe what the government can do in terms of incentivizing it or um you know regulatory point of view. Yeah. For the government there's different types of policy that can support the space. There's scientific policy and industrial policy. So I think funding more science in this direction makes a lot of sense because a lot of what we're working with like I say is still foundational open science questions that will get us to orders of magnitude improvements in what we can do on the basis of taste and cost etc right so I think having more specialized grant programs working with organizations like GFI to kind of craft what those look like looking at developing a talent pool in a very deliberate way right so and we, people do this with different types of sectors so there's great skill india initiatives etc where they might look at oh we need these many chemical engineers in the country etc and we need to map that for this new industry as well so investing on that side of talent development scientific research etc and then on the industrial side i think having uh, industrial incentives usually comes in the direction of things like tax holidays etc for certain types of businesses that are socially important or politically important and i think that's that's what this sector should be right socially important and therefore receive certain kinds of benefits in that vein right um one example of things that people in other industries have pushed for is to have research spending for companies be considered tax free which would be great even for our sector right so broad based reform as well as special incentives for our sector um going beyond government you also asked about scientists i think taking up these research topic especially because many of these are allied to what they're already doing and therefore are quite interesting to them and i've seen this by the way like working with folks at these universities they might be world class experts in what they're doing but going in there as a non scientist non phd etc myself and still being able to work with them and say hey look this is kind of where the field is right now here's what's at lab scale pilot scale what's shovel ready for scale up here's the different research topics you could pursue here's the specific mix of nutrients you use to drive down the cost of cultivation of cells for cultivated mm. meat etc transfer of knowledge as well yeah they love that they love working on these questions right so i think do more of that right and then i think by virtue of working on that it makes it more interesting for government to invest in so it's a two way street right so these folks because they work in government research institutes are very highly respected by those same committees that fund work like this and so it's it's been really important to work with them um entrepreneurs i think uh like i said i think more inter collaboration in the sector makes a lot of sense uh we've had a great experience working with very many entrepreneurs things like for example if they're going in to do a presentation at a fast food company or a large corporation or like any kind of restaurant etc they'll work with us to understand kind of how do you market this stuff on menus what is the outcome we want from them stuff like that what's the best practices around this so i think just open lines of communication inter collaboration i think that 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 all makes a lot of sense and i think also looking at maybe across the supply chain where are there where are there continued gaps so do does it make sense for me to start yet another brand or should i be focusing on building an ingredients company etc that that's an interesting question so what if you have a vegan chicken brand and i have a vegan chicken brand are we not competing and how do we find ways to come together if it's the same product certainly like i say one area on which collaboration is possible is in appealing to consumers because i think carving out a larger slice of a tiny pie makes no sense right like i say large smart protein wave lifting all boats that's what we want so that's an area of of collaboration that makes a lot of sense right other than that of course on some level you are competing right um yeah and then investors and philanthropists um uh, i think critical support catalytic support like i was saying earlier is like always the thing that's lacking it's in the definition right it's called catalytic support right like the point is that there will always be valleys of death or areas where there's critical missing funding and for a sector like this which is still very early people need to take more risk to move it forward right and like i would argue you know without naming names 
some of these those other like banks that I mentioned earlier or some of these other folks that say that they're funding climate sectors, this is an opportunity, right? It is maybe a higher risk opportunity than funding the next two-wheeler electric vehicle com company because there's already an established market for that. But considering how big of an issue meat is from a climate standpoint, it would be in line with their mandates, with what they want to achieve as individuals and organizations on this planet to take the risk and allocate some proportion of their portfolio to this. And it makes a lot of sense. I think individuals have a bigger risk appetite than governments and NGOs, I imagine. So if it's private inv private investors and angel investors tapping into this and making, you know, being the first movers and first investors in that case, I think that'll really that kind of gives governments and NGOs, I think, that little bit of validation that, hey, you know, somebody that I look up to as an investor is investing in this sector and maybe that means, you know, I can I can do this as well. So do you think it's it depends on private individuals a lot more than it does in, does in governments and NGOs? Yeah, I think potentially that angel investors, individuals, which could be individuals or family offices, right? Angel investor type folks. Just, just private investors in general, private investment institutions. Yeah. I feel like they just have a bigger risk appetite. They can just take of bigger course. risks than of course. It, all, the government. It, it, it depends on where the money's coming from. So usually they also have LPs, limited partners that have put money into their fund, which is why I think actually angels or family offices might have even more of a risk appetite that's based on their value system rather than being in a fund where you're investing across agriculture. And the question is, okay, should I allocate the entirety of this to whatever else? Or should I you know, carve out a portion of this for, all, for smart protein? Yeah. So that's from, and philanthropy. Yeah, philanthropy, I think, uh, hey, I can uh, pass you on to the Good Food Institute. Uh, I think, I, I really do think it is it is a great organization that's a great funding opportunity to scale this sector, right? So it's like essential infrastructure and like interstitial to everything that happens in the sector. Other than that, I think um, there would be, you know, it doesn't even have to go into the budget of the Good Food Institute. It could be programs that we're doing that make sense, right? So things like research centers. So let's say, this space 20 years from now will be seen as visionary. It'll also be seen as obvious. I really do think that like 20, 30, 50 years from now, we'll be looking back at animal agriculture and saying, why why not soon? Why, why not sooner, right? Like we really should be consigning it to the dustbin of history much faster than it's happening now. So great. Like why don't we start a center today, center of excellence today, that's named after you, Mrs. Philanthropist XYZ, that will be seen as visionary for all of history. Right, like it makes a lot of sense, yeah. So it could just be program initiatives like that. It doesn't have to be operating budget for GFI, but you get the point. Is the link between climate change and food tech and animal agriculture is that missing? Is that why a lot of climate tech funds don't include food tech or um, smart protein in their portfolio? Yeah, great question. I think globally, smart protein institutions, including GFI, have done a really good job of getting us a seat at the climate table. So it's being seen very clearly now as like a, it's a mainstream climate area. So like, for example, a couple of months ago, a report that I co-authored for the UN Environmental Program on all proteins, it's called What's Cooking? An assessment of novel alternatives to animal-based products. That. So that, that just came out. So that, that's an indication that this is becoming more and more mainstream, right? The UN Environmental Program put out a report that's squarely focused on this, that's been distributed at COP28. It was released at COP28 to all UN member nations, and it's meant to prepare policymakers and other actors in the system on how to support and prepare for alternative That was growth. part of the global stock take as well, I, I believe. So. Yeah. yeah, I believe yeah, so. I At think least so. food was addressed in the global yeah, stock. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So this past COP28 was also considered the food COP. And I, I recognize that there's going to be disappointment with how, with how far it went or what exactly happened with it or whatever. I'm, I'm not even commenting on that. I don't even know, to be honest. I was at COP, and I think my biggest disappointment was that a climate conference, the climate, uh, you know, conference of parties that's all about climate change was serving meat in the first yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been at a few that serve like, you know, here's this Atlantic salmon thing <laughs> and we're all talking about like ocean acidification while we're eating Atlantic salmon or they're eating Atlantic salmon, whatever. Uh, it feels weird, but feels feels silly. Because I think food tech is considered like a separate thing. Yeah. And all protein is just like in a, in a separate bucket and climate tech is all about, you know, your EVs, your renewable energy to any other it's it's just more like tech focused but outside of food for some reason i don't know why that distinction exists um investing is oftentimes a fomo driven business right like uh, and i say this with all the love and no like not a hint of, this is not pejorative what i'm saying right 
to the to folks who are in investment but like capital is going to just cluster towards areas that are growing really fast and on a social level one could argue that that's not what capital should do right it should cluster to things that are important and neglected yeah and it can also dictate and change that yeah but look we are the largest two wheeler market in the world and that's why all the capital's gone into that right it just it just makes sense right and there are other areas other than smart proteins that are also neglected within climate tech funding right i would argue building materials or heating and cooling and etc we should have like sustainable air conditioning companies that are like scaled already in india it just isn't happening fast enough right but yes smart protein is particularly neglected in that landscape i think it's um yeah i think i think we need to go back to the drawing board a little bit in terms of building specialized funds that create a ladder to like the larger funds then getting involved and etc cetera, etc cetera. so hopefully gfi and the folks involved all the entrepreneurs etc um you know without minimizing anyone else's role i just know what's happening inside gfi right but hopefully folks can kind of come together and move that forward in a way that's very deliberate yeah what's the most exciting innovations that are happening in this space what what are the future trends what you know gives you hope and what yeah what excites you primarily in this in this space the whole thing is incredibly exciting i know that like right now we're in a bit of a uh, like everyone's kind of like oh my god everything's going to hell i don't think that's true i think if you just if you stay with the science that stuff is incredibly exciting and in fact you know people ask me questions all the time like wait isn't cultivated meat this like sexy moonshot technology it's like a biotech thing maybe not to the listeners of this podcast where like there's there's like that sounds icky from a vegan standpoint but from an investment and like an e- economic standpoint people get distracted by shiny objects right so they're like okay isn't the scientific frontier all in this like fermentation cultivated meat side that's not even necessarily true there's so much progress that can still be made in plant based right where we can get again orders of magnitude difference in how these things taste and the cost and all that stuff that's really exciting to me right like, all of this stuff is incredibly exciting what about ingredients and innovation and technology what about that because i've seen people make uh, milk out of air yes right there's cool. there's things really cool you know stuff those there. stuffs are there, is there anything you've come across <sighs> yeah there's some i mean i think one thing that particularly excites me is um hybrid products again like i said i think long enough time scale all of this stuff will just be called meat and you'll just look at the ingredients but what if we cultivated just animal fat cells and use those in combination with an existing plant based product so right now what are we saying the plant based products are out there but many of them are not there from a taste standpoint what if what we need is a little bit of animal fat in there but we cultivated the animal fat right so like it's got that rich profile in your mouth it's like making your mouth water it's juicy etc but it's a hybrid product and because it's only using the fat it's not as expensive as making a full cultivated meat product would entail or whatever right so again i recognize not the least technological thing but um, really exciting stuff the school stuff going on what is the role of ai and 3d printing in the in the all protein sector yeah it's actually kind of interesting right so all of these other technologies that are being developed are in some way able to collide with smart protein right so if you look at for example i think you were mentioning earlier we didn't talk about it but you were mentioning even things like blockchain in agriculture that can be used to make supply chains more efficient in general so it could be used to make smart protein supply chains more efficient and more and better characterized but that's 3d printed meat as well a lot of i think restaurants use this technology yeah. to do steaks and i mean different kind of 3d printing is like one more technology that could be revolutionary that people have been talking about for a while if we can figure out how to scale it um you know what we're talking about really is creating a cut of meat that has all the texture bite juiciness etc so doesn't it stand to reason that maybe if you're 3d printing it you're able to control the texture a little bit better right like that that's kind of the idea what so what goes into the 3d printing if if we're 3d printing meat it would be the same materials with the same ingredients that that would that would go into a plant based meat that's made through an extrusion process really here what you're replacing is the process of extrusion or whatever other process you would have used to make it you're 3d printing it instead everything else should be roughly the same and that only the texture The, the argument is that it might improve the texture you might be able to encapsulate fat a bit better you might be able to so like the things that have been easy to make thus far have been keema right like it's it's easy it's much easier to make granules or like mints than it is to make a structured end product that stands to reason because it's a more complex te- texture i've had 3d printed steak at uh, this restaurant called gotier in in london and he does incredible i mean plant based michelin star restaurants i think they've used that i've tried it in sweden and so they did definitely using that to try 3d printed steak for sure but yeah keema as well i imagine i think that's a company called redefine meat and i i that redefine meat nova meat these are companies that are doing 3d printing for for steaks particularly around the world 
Um, and there you might need to use something like 3D printing. Whereas what I was saying is with any of these products, making a keema or a mince is easier and you don't need complex processes like 3D printing. But it's possible that to make end products like steaks, which is like kind of like a gold standard product culturally, right? Like even in the US, everyone's not eating a steak all the time. Burgers are like minced products that are reconstituted. That's a simpler product that people are eating all the time because steaks cost more money or it's seen as more of a luxury thing. But a steak seems to be for a meat eater like a cultural touchstone, right? Like I want to have my steak, right? So I think maybe to get there, we need things like 3D printing, which is exciting. It's cool. 3D printers also might be useful to make space food. So like this is like really long time scale stuff, but some of the some of the companies in our space have seen success with government grant programs for space food. Plant-based space food. Um, cultivated meat even. Because think about it, you only need to carry a little, little starter kit and you are able to have a food, meat, which you would have otherwise certainly not been able to have in space. You're not carrying a cow to space. You could carry cow cells to space, right? So like a couple of companies have done, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Aleph Farms in Israel and Finless Foods out of San Francisco have done like showing that their cells can be cultivated on the International Space Station. That's so promising. Which is really cool, yeah. In that space. I know you've moved on from JFI. So what's next for you? What's brewing? I've just no taken... Idea. Firstly, let me, let me do a quick plug for taking care of yourself. Yeah, uh, you, please. You, Shreya, as well as everyone else that's listening to this, uh, the stuff we're talking about is important things that, are, that need your talent. And if you are going to be able to work for them, work on them for the long term, you also need to take care of yourself. So I've... Uh, I've had a bit of an interesting health journey over the last couple of years, which is why I moved on from GFI. Took a, I took about four to six months fully off, hung out with my doggy, my nephew, played video games uh, with my brother-in-law, lots of fun stuff. Dealing with burnout? Yeah, just recovering from generalized burnout. Uh, and now I'm working on bringing some of this network, some of these skills that I've learned in, in Smart Protein to starting a new organization that kind of looks like GFI, but for broader climate technologies. So everything that we're talking about now, intersection of science, industry, and policy for smart protein, that playbook kind of applies in all of these other spaces, right? So energy and mobility are really well capitalized already, but there's still room to support folks there. I think in all of the other like other areas of climate tech, so let's say broader green chemistry, where all of the things we use today, cleaning materials, surfactants, paints, etc., are produced in a certain way. That is quite uh, polluted. It's, it's not good for us. I don't think it's, yeah. it's the, the best. A lot routine. of them are a legacy from the industrial revolution and we've been making things the same way for a very long time. We're seeing a revolution of biology there or whatever, different ways of producing these things so that the material itself is less polluting and the process is certainly less polluting, etc. Right. So there's that, there's building materials. So, you know, folks, great folks that are already operating in climate tech say they've seen a lot of green concrete, so reduced emissions concrete, but nothing else. So that's leaving like, you know, 70% by volume of building materials on the table in terms of innovation, right? Whereas we have this huge build out necessary in terms of infrastructure, residential, commercial, etc. in India Built and places like India. Huge carbon footprint, sorry. Yeah. Heating and cooling, right? Air conditioning globally, something like 3% of emissions probably will be higher in, in India because again, air conditioning is also actually aspirational and we have all these climate conditions and rising incomes, etc. So we will have this like largest single digit percentage of total emissions come from air conditioning. You know, sustainable air conditioners exist. They're just very expensive for the Indian market. Heat pumps exist, very expensive for the Indian market. Right? So there's, there's this possibility for fundamental innovation or scale up, bringing people together, investing in factories, better policy, better regulation, better trade. Across sectors and across industries. Across sectors, yeah. This field building playbook, I think it applies, it generalizes really well to all of these spaces. So while I am um, sad to be Sad to have left a space that I really identify with and obviously will continue to collaborate and, and try to keep in touch with everyone in this space. Uh, I'm excited for the next chapters. Yeah, but like you said, climate tech is food tech and I think food tech is climate tech and they need to go hand in hand. But I think you're just making it bigger and diversifying it. Is there an ideal celebrity mascot or a celebrity ambassador that you, know, you see fitting for the all protein or smart protein movement? So we've had some great celebrities already invest in, some of them start companies in smart proteins, right? So I think everyone knows that John Abraham has been on like a, on a plant-based milk, sorry, what's the name of the company? SoFit. He's been, he's been on SoFit, I believe, plant-based milk for the longest time. And he's a great ambassador in terms of how people see him for health and et cetera. And he's also been quite passionate, I believe, in supporting some of these causes and in partnerships, et cetera. 
Um, we've seen Ritesh and Janilia Deshmukh start a company, Imagine Me. Uh, we've seen Virat and Anushka invest in Blue Virat Tribe. Virat Kohli and Anushka Sharma invest in Blue Tribe Foods. Yeah. And we have seen MS Dhoni invest in Chaka Hari. I think all of these folks are great spokespeople for the space. I think the general rules apply, right? All of these companies, just because they've had these celebrities, aren't going to go to the moon immediately. We have to solve all of these other issues first. But, um, you know, I've, I've had great experiences with all of them and, and their level of interest in the space. The number one celebrity or personality that could support this space. Hypothetically or ideally. Uh, the Prime be... Minister Narendra Modi ji. If he supported this space. Uh, he, if he supported this space, I think it would go to the moon. I think the ability that he now has to influence entire industries and move things forward. And again, I'll just make a quick plug. Um, if he's listening. This fits from a moral ethical standpoint with a lot of what uh, we want to achieve in this country from a religiosity standpoint, right? And it also fits from a from a growing new industries and innovation standpoint, and also taking bringing India to the centerpiece of the world globally. I think they've done a great job, for example, with G20, with some of the new what are known as mini lateral al alignments. There's something called the Quad that's been formed with India, Japan, Australia, and the US, right? So these new alignments internationally, where India's playing a more important role geopolitically and taking center stage which is only right considering our historical position, our population, our influence on talent, etc. globally. This could be an area where we take a leadership position as well. And also feeding billions of people. Yeah, you know, so the whole feeding 10 billion thing is because there will be 10 billion people on this planet in 2050. One sixth of them will be Indian, right? And when we've spoken to government agencies, let's say like Niti Aayog, I first spoke to them in March 12th, 2018, right? On that day, they designated the chair of that meeting to be Sri Vinod Paul, who was their, who's their health person. And his first question, which was very savvy, was, hey, listen, can we manufacture these, let's say, in Delhi and send them to Northeast India and have them include all the nutrients we need to supply in all the parts of the country? Because he was thinking about the National Nutrition Initiative, right? So I think the idea is uh, very sound that we could actually nourish how many other billions of people, let's say 2 billion people in India and 10 billion people globally by that time. Yeah, so it solves a lot of our issues and challenges that we're going to face as a recovering economy, as a growing economy, for that matter. So, okay, he'd be your ideal ambassador for this movement. If you were a food critique and you had to give like 10 on 10 for a plant-based issue you've ever had, what would that be? Do you have a favorite sibling? I have one sibling and I guess he's my favorite one because he's the only one. Okay, if you what if you had 70 siblings? Would you have a favorite? Is that how you look at food? Yeah, I, there's no, I, I, I don't have a favorite. They're all great. There's no dish you've ever tried that's been like, this has blown my mind and I could eat this for the rest of my life. Oh, you know what? I thought you were asking me about specific companies. Uh, okay, in terms of food, like a dish, I'm so boring when it comes to food though. Like honestly, for me personally. What do you eat? What's your favorite food? Like what's your... Gun to your head. This is the last meal you're ever going to have. What are you going to eat? Thai food, Indian food or Mexican food. You don't so get lots a of little choice. Like Gun to your head. You curries, don't get a that choice. Kind of stuff. <laughs> this is not a buffet. You okay. get one dish. Okay, wait, wait. Tofu, <laughs> tofu, green curry. That'd be your go-to meal. Yes. Okay, so uh, we, we've Ironically, come to a conclusion. We've got a winner. Yes. Out yeah. of the 70 siblings, you've chosen tofu. I also really yeah. like kebabs and stuff. So, yeah. A plant-based Sikh kebab. Fully vegan, no animal ghee included. One convincing argument for anyone to at least try all protein. I think that's in the argument. I think try it one day a week. So like go, do a, do a plant-based Monday, right? Uh, I think that's the idea. Okay. Any convincing argument for somebody to care about climate change if they think that's something that doesn't matter to them or that's a problem that is not close to them? And if that's an issue that maybe I shouldn't care about because climate. Yeah. Um, I want my kids to live on this planet, do you? This is a literal thing that I've said in government meetings when they've asked me, like, why, like, why are you doing this? What's in it for you? And I, want my, I want my kids to live on this planet. Seems to work. If they don't want kids, you use something. A whole else, separate you, argument. You, you get the point, yeah. What does sustainability mean to you? Um, continuing to live and thrive and flourish on this planet, right? So not on Mars, but on this planet in ways that do not continue to break the planet. Right. And hopefully also nourish the planet more and more. Varun, how can we support you? How can we support the journey that you're on and whatever you're going to do next, especially in the climate tech space? Keep doing what you're doing. Right. Like I think uh, I think you're uniquely placed in a way that I am not to 
talk to people about this, build narrative, build hope in folks. Uh, I think that's, I, I see my work as an essential complement to your work. And so keep doing what you're doing. Additional to that, um, I'm happy to be stepping into other spaces as well where there are other people doing great work already. Climate tech is not new, right? There's people that have been doing great work in those spaces. So I'm delighted to, or very excited to collaborate with a lot of those. So I'm hoping maybe we can do more, whether it's content or whether it's other types of initiatives together. Yes, I'd definitely love to find ways to work together because you're doing incredible things. And I, uh, you know, loved, I've seen the journey that you've been on and the impact that you've created. And it's, it's absolutely incredible. And I, I can't wait to see what you, what you do next. So thank you so much for doing this with me. And thank you so much for all the knowledge, all the insights, everything that I've learned from this podcast that I didn't know, even though I've been vegan for eight years now. And there are these lot of terminologies that I'd never, you know, looked into or read up about. So thank you so much for teaching me all of this in the first place and all of our listeners. So thank you. My pleasure. It's been a privilege being here and also doing this work so that I could learn these things myself. So. 